By the way, if you think that you're going to win this fight by assassinating Trump, I have news for you. Interest rates go to 6% tomorrow. And I have all the reasons in the world to justify that. And then you all are screwed anyway, because you can't you can't maintain the, the system that you have. And then you'll have to do the whole thing where you kill the Fed, bring it back under the Treasury, and destroy the country. And the American people just voted for against that. We're going to see um, the, the gold produced um, here in the United States isn't going to flow as easily around the world as it has for the last 50 years. It's, it's going to become much more of a strategic asset in, in, a, in a financial sense. Um, so I think we're going to see, I think the Fed is not going to fight a higher gold price. They're just not going to fight a higher, they're not going to fight the higher gold price in the same way they used to, which was to keep it down. They're going to allow it to rise slowly in order to recapitalize the, uh, the U.S. balance sheet it, and its, its balance sheet as well. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and, of course, your host of this channel. And as you can see, I'm not in my usual studio. I'm at the Precious Metal Summits in Zurich, and I'm very thankful that we can use one of the meeting rooms to conduct this interview. It's much appreciated. Great conference down here in Zurich the last two days, about to wrap up here and uh, head off to Munich for a change. Now, we have lots to discuss with our guest today. It's Tom Longo. He's returning. He's a returning guest. He's the publisher of the newsletter Gold, Goats, and Guns. And I've said it before. It's probably one of my favorite names for a newsletter. I absolutely love it. Whiskey and Gunpowder is, is, is a close second, but uh, I, I love it. And I love our, the conversations I have with Tom. We have lots to discuss. Uh, of course, election outcome in the U.S. is the big topic. One topic that sort of follows that directly is the abolishment of the Fed. Hashtag end the Fed is a big topic that's been circulating again. Elon Musk added some fuel to the fire. And I'm really curious what Tom has to say about that and uh, what, what he thinks the Fed should do and uh, will be doing in the next uh, you know months here as well. Um, before I switch over to my guest, quick reminder, 80% of you watching are not subscribed. One free way to support us is just by hitting that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously, and we do appreciate it. Now, without much further ado, Tom, it is great to have you back on the program. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, Kai. Thank you for the invite, and I hope uh, you're doing well. Yeah, doing great. Uh, you can probably tell I could, should have put on some makeup. I've been running around here in Zurich in meetings all week, but uh, and all day actually. So I should have actually put some matte makeup on. But uh, and uh, <laughs> lo lo lots to discuss though. Um, sentiment is a bit uh, somber almost here at the conference. Like while it was great in Beaver Creek at the, at the Precious Metals Conference, where we talked yeah. junior mining stocks, by the way. Um, right. it, it's cooled down because the gold price has come down, and I think it also has to do with a lot with the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, of the U.S. election, the outcome, and what investors can expect from it. Maybe we'll start there as a discussion topic. Let's generalize it a bit. Like, how, how happy are you with the election result? And B, what can we expect next? Okay, so one, I'm really happy with the Trump election results, um, knowing full well that now they stole or have stolen down ballot seats and certainly at least uh, three Senate seats and a few House seats probably. But it looks like we're going to wind up with a... Trump's going to wind up with a, a majority in the Senate and the House. I think it's going to wind up being, once he's done moving certain people into his cabinet, like Marco Rubio and others, out of the Senate and into his cabinet, then he can re replace them with you know real folks on the other side and create a rhino-proof majority in the Senate and set, a, uh, set the tone in the House. If that's the case, and we'll see how that plays out over the course of the next couple of months, um, then I'm cautiously optimistic, if not, you know, ecstatic as to what's going on here. Like I, like, for example, Marco Rubio being moved out, uh, being in a state, Florida, which is highly conservative at this point or highly red and 13 points, almost 14 points red. Ron DeSantis gets to just appoint a replacement. He doesn't have to go through any kind of special election. We don't have to waste time with all of that. So Marco Rubio moving out and Marco being a very compromised figure. Um, I like to say that his Manila index, Manila folder index is very high. Um, I think Trump will keep him on a short leash and moving him out of the Senate and at the secretary of state is a place where he can do the job and like project the, the project a little bit of crazy, which I think Trump is going to want to do on the foreign policy front because he's got a very bad hand and then use that as a means to, by, by which to start, um, trying to drive some negotiations. And then when Rubio has served his purpose, 
he'll be fired. And then he's no longer a senator. And we can get two real senators from Florida as opposed to two, you know, as opposed to fake ones. And that's a good, and that's a net good. So we'll, we'll leave it there. Other than that, I think the election results were one of those, one of those edifying moments, I think, for a great number of people, not just for the American people, as a great statement by us, but a statement by us that can then be taken by the rest of the world to, okay, this is what we're doing. And yeah, you asked us to lead us out of the darkness. Now we're doing it. We did it. Let's go from there. And uh, the knock-on effects politically around around Europe and, and whatnot have been fascinating to watch. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Me being in Germany, you know, right. just uh, the political shakeup is uh, is ridiculous and how fast the pace is or how fast it is accelerating here as well. It's interesting to see the the nervousness around the Globe Canada as well. I'm seeing uh, some feathers being ruffled up uh, up north uh, uh, as well. So really interesting. Um, I think mm -hmm. we should touch on geopolitics in a second. Um, I want to mm -hmm. start with the economy. Um, sure. So where, where do you see the biggest impact? Like you, you see a new, new president coming in early January. What's the first thing he's going to do and uh, what, what should he do maybe first? Cut spending by a lot. Uh, his incoming uh, pick for Treasury Secretary has already talked about somewhere close to, a, what, a trillion and a half dollars in cuts that he can do without having to go to Congress. This is just regulate. This is just regulatory, executive branch stuff, you know, repealing executive orders that have been implemented. Um, and this is all what I I've been saying this for three years. I mean, when everybody said three years ago, and I was crazy that you know Powell's going to start raising interest rates hard, and he can do so because he now has the ability to do so because he controls the price of dollars to so far as opposed to LIBOR. Everybody looked at me and I had four heads, and I said, "Well, if you do, if he raises interest rates, that's going to balloon out the the payment on the debt, and then 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 there's going to be a fiscal trap." I'm like, "Well, then we have to cut spending now, though. Now, don't we? Well, they'll never do that, really." So the American people just gave us a mandate to cut spending, and we got a guy that's going to come into the Treasury Department and go, hey, "We can, we've got at least." And then we got Elon Musk with the you know, Department of Governmental, you know, Efficiency, and he's going to bring Ron Paul and his staff in to like start cutting stuff. Like we can do this. Like the, you know, Kai, I, when I, I've watched narratives be destroyed by actions taken by disruptive people for over a decade now, and I always like to go back to. Um, Putin's movement into Syria in 2015. All summer long, we were told ISIS will take five years to get rid of, and it's a they're dug in like ticks, and we can't beat ISIS, and blah 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 blah. And I was saying to myself, going, we can read license plates from space, but we can't find Toyota Hiluxes running around with you know with 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 guys in the in the desert. We can't find these guys and blow them up from you know with drones from orbit. Like we can't do this. Like of course we can do this. Like we've had this technology for years. We didn't want to because ISIS was working for us. Putin moves in with the Air Force, starts running 42 sorties a day with 14 planes or 18 planes or some insane thing, blows the whole thing wide open, you know, gives air air support to the Syrian army, and they and they run the table on these guys in six months. And it's the same thing with our fiscal situation. So the fiscal situation can be fixed. Okay. It just needs to be, we have to realize that. Global capital will move to where it's treated best. So if Trump overhauls the regulatory framework and it loosens up the restrictions on our businesses, opens up drilling, opens up all of these things, and overhauls the tax code and changes the tariff structure, we can drive trillions of dollars of onshoring into the United States in very short order. And I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. On the morning after the election, when it was announced that Trump had won, the Dow opened up 1,300 points. Now, the Dow is the, is the U.S. index that likes, that's, that's the closest thing to tracking international capital flow into and out of the United States. It's a good proxy for that. I, I learned that from Martin Armstrong. Big caps. Now, on the other side of it, that morning, the bond market sold off about 14, 15 basis points. So there was a rotation out of bonds and into stocks. The rest of the week on Thursday and Friday, what do we see? The, 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 the Dow held all those gains and the U.S. bond market gave back those 10 of, 10 of those 15 basis points that lost. It took back 10 of those 15 basis points that lost. And, to, and this week, the, the bond market's been flat, meaning we had, a, we had a rotation on Wednesday and then we had a massive capital inflow on Thursday and Friday. And right now, the yield curve is flat. So I expect the Fed to start cutting interest rates. If the Fed, if Trump is serious about cutting spending, then Powell has made it abundantly clear. And he said this at the presser the other day, and he's been on this point for months. If you 
cut the fiscal, if you improve the fiscal side of the balance sheet, I will accommodate you with lower interest rates, cutting more. It's exactly what I said before the election. I said this in multiple, multiple, multiple newsletters that I've written. I said, I, the, I laid out the, 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 the trade. If Harris wins, Powell won't cut rates much, if not raise rates in order to make the spending she wants to do expensive. And he's going to, he's going to put that, put the kibosh on that. And if Trump wins and Trump is serious about, you know, fiscal reform and Powell will, you know, distrust, but verify like I would just sit there and wait. Okay, do it. And he can cut rates slowly. And then we get into the 20, the, the January and March, 2025 meetings. If, you know, they start slashing, they start firing people left and right and moving people out of DC, like, and Powell believes it, he'll cut rates because he'll be, he'll have the room to do so, which will then free up the holes, which will then fill in the holes in the bank's balance sheets, which were incurred during the, the high interest rate raise. And then the, we'll have a normally upsloping yield curve because the short end of the curve will fall. The long end of the curve will probably hold serve between four and a half and 5%. We'll have a normally upsloping yield curve. The banks can lend normally to normal Americans and we can get back to business. And then, you know, we'll have to deal with an inflation wave on top of that. There's no doubt about that, which is coming in the, across the, across the, the commodity sector and especially, and I think, and also in gold and silver, but Powell has to make a choice. He can choose the labor market and rebuilding the country, or he can choose another round of inflation. He can't avoid another round of inflation. There was just too much money printed after COVID, during and after COVID. It's going to take two business cycles at, at a minimum to get rid of it all. And, you know, we had one round. We're going to have another one. Yeah, no, absolutely. The question that arises, though, like Trump only has one term, four years to, to mm -hmm. make a change and a difference, right? Um, right. Deficit spending is one topic that needs to be tackled. Debt, debt reduction is probably a whole different ballgame as well, because trying to cut $2 trillion of spending a year or minimum $2 trillion is a big ask. Like, really. what, what are the immediate touch points? Like, Not really. That's like, the point. I mean, I mean I see, I'm serious about this when I say this. So much of that can be done <laughs> literally at the regulatory level through the stroke of a pen by the executive. Done. No. The Congress does not need to be consulted on this. Jargacy and Chevron will take care of a lot of this. Like I'm saying, I'm dead serious. Like it, there's a lot that can be done. There's so much waste. There are so many jobs that can be cut. It's not funny. And I, and I urge everybody to watch the Tucker Carlson interview with Vivek Ramaswamy, where he goes through this about how to do this mechanically. And it's a, it was eye-opening to me because I hadn't really thought about it, the mechanics of it, but it clearly Vivek has and the, his staff have. So, yeah. Interesting. No, it's uh, like Inflation Reduction Act and things come to mind that we indirectly benefited here in the mining industry, obviously, because right. there's been quite a few checks uh, written and uh, su projects supported, rightly right. and wrongly. That's a different discussion. But uh, sure. do, do you see that continue, by the way? It's like uh, su support for mining projects like... Uh, you know, yes. uh, grants and things like if, it would make sense if, if he were, you know, true to his word of supporting an American economy. Yeah. And what he's going to likely do is he's just going to remove the restrictions on all of this stuff. Like a lot of this stuff is just bound down through EPA mandates. And again, we had a lot of legislation written by the three letter agencies on while Chevron was in effect from 1984 until last year, we had the three letter agencies writing law. Because Congress had abdicated its uh, responsibility to write law and handed it over to the to the agencies, and the Supreme Court blessed this. That was tyrannical. That in, that encouraged the growth of the administrative state, and the and uh, and completed you know James Burnham's the managerial revolution here in the United States. I got news for you. That's over. It's done, and it can be reversed in a week if everybody has the will to do so. It's that simple. And so that's the way it should be done. That allows then the banks and the mining industries and the mining industry and, you know, the people, who, the financiers within the mining industry to, to open up their, open up their checkbooks and their wallets and get, and get work done. Like, and, you know, I'm thinking specifically about like royalty companies like Royal Gold and Franklin Nevada and whatnot, along with the predatory Wall Street bank lending. There's a whole, that's a whole discussion, right? That I've had, I had that the com uh, conversation with, Vince Lanchi on my podcast uh, about, you know, the mining industry and the, the troubles that it's had financially over the years. Um, you change the regulatory landscape for this. You change the financial landscape of how we, how, how we handle capital within that industry. And that 
changes the rules of the game and it's going to change the way capital flows into and out of that uh, those businesses. And that's what we need to yeah. say. Yeah, permitting timelines are are crucial, of course, because cost mm -hmm. of capital is expensive, and uh, it's yeah. just the time time cost efficiency is is not given sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, another topic like Trump has been getting some blowback and pushback on from mm -hmm. the general public is tariffs. Obviously, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a big one. Um, people, I think, have a hard time understanding what it actually means. Mm -hmm. um, adding tariffs, and everybody's worried. You you mentioned inflation. A lot of people went that, go that way. It's like, well, you, the consumer has to pay for it in the end. The yes, question I agree. is, does, does he? Does the consumer have to pay for tariffs? How will it be reflected? And what's what's the impact of potential tariffs? Uh, I, I'm, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like tariffs are going to wind up or, or always in the end paid by the domestic economy. But here's the problem. That's what they've been doing to Europe. I, I was watching Harold Lutnick on CNBC the other day, and he was reminding everybody that, oh, by the way, we never talk about this. But there's a 100% tariff on American cars into Europe. And 100% tariff on all of these things that you know that we uh, that we export in order to help, and we put those in place during the Marshall Plan in order to um, help rebuild Germany and Japan, or you know Europe and Japan. They're still in place no. to this day. Why? Those tariffs are still in place, and Lutnick is literally asking the question, "Why?" So until those tariffs come off. Then we should, you know, maybe use the weapon and in order to get them to bring them down. The point of the tariff is the threat that the existing system where they get to export to us, but we don't get to export to them is over. That's what Trump is threatening here. That's what Lutnick is threatening. That's what they're all threatening. And so what they're really trying to do is threaten the tariffs to get rid of the whole tariff structure, which remember as part of my whole argument that i've been making for three years is that the goal of davos what i like to call davos or now i kind of morphed it into evil corp central um this you know to like the whole goal is to bring the efficiency of the american economy down to the level of whatever the sclerotic old industries of europe are and they do that through OECD tax harmonization rules. They do it through tariffs. They do it through regulations. They do it through, you know, things like the GDPR, the German data protection requirements. They do it through threats and all of this, all of this stuff. They do it through the, like the third energy bundle, which, you know, package, which killed the South Stream pipeline and forced Gazprom to unbundle the gas from the pipeline and all this. It's all, it's all nonsense. It's all designed to raise the cost of, imports into Europe so that they pay below market prices for our stuff and we have to pay above market prices for their stuff. It's a capital drain, net capital drain on everybody. That Those days are over and Trump has made it abundantly clear that he understands that Europe is as much the problem as China is. China is an easy solve because the Chinese want a deal. The problem is the Europeans don't want a deal. And so they literally have attempted a coup against our country using help with help from the Chinese, I might add. But they've attempted a coup against the country through the Obama administration and the Biden administration and the deep state to keep this from, you know, to keep America, to destroy America. And I'm, I'm freaking over it, dude. I'm just not playing with it. And it's not good for Germans and it hasn't been good for Britons and it hasn't been good for French or Italians or Portuguese or anybody else. It's been good for their oligarchs as they, you know, as they form their more perfect technocratic Soviet Union in the in the in Brussels, okay, great, but the hell with those people. I'm over it. And I, you know, this is a moment where we can all just step back and stop acting like slaves and start acting like like men. How about no to all these 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 freaking project managers over in Brussels? Like, how about no? And the and the Achilles heel for them is that they've promised trillions of dollars in future cash flow over the over winning the war in Ukraine and breaking up Russia to the most evil people on the planet and the cash call is due and we're really on the verge right now finally of a, of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe that I've been you know I've been seeing over the horizon for years but it's finally I think it's finally here I'm, the way I'm watching the markets play literally this morning it's beginning to feel like okay the dam has finally burst with the euro down to 106 the pound falling down, the euro, the euro pound cross breaking out of its the bottom of its range, um, 
you know, and uh, Lagarde furiously trying to hold German bond yields down in the face of German political upheaval, of the likes of which we haven't seen since the end of World War II. Like the German government just failed. Yeah. Like that's not that's unprecedented in the in the post World War history. No, no, I can't wait for re-elections. Quite honestly, because mm. the the way it was going it was like it was ruining us quite literally, yeah, like high are. energy costs. And, like, and, and and it was designed from on, on purpose. It was a, a, both a, a both a Brussels thing and the city of London thing. And those are not the same things. But Germany has always been in the crosshairs because their goal was to keep Germany and Russia from ever doing the the natural stitch up that no. everybody anybody with two eyes to see can figure out is the is the gig and you know that was that's one of the few things that they all agree about at, at evil corp central so that's like evil corp central then there's davos and the british remnant are subsidiaries thereof in my in my taxonomy just to give you guys a just to make things clear okay yeah no it makes it makes sense like at some point like where does stupidity end and where does plant plant stupidity start right like let's mm -hmm. call it that like it really like, is how, how stupid can one person be to, to, to abolish the nuclear reactors and uh, jack up energy costs, for example, and just all of a sudden Volkswagen has to fire 30,000 people because we're just not competitive anymore, right? It's because it's like, not, I guess it's not stupidity. It's vandalism. And when yeah. you look at it, and when you, when you see it, when you, when you flip the, when you flip the frame and go, oh, they're not incompetent. They're intentionally destroying their country yes. because their goal is to destroy national sovereignty and national identity and culture and this and that because they really are freaking communists. They really are Marxists at the like fundamental ideological level, and they hate anything beautiful. The one of the things you have to remember is that at the core of Marxist thinking is an unquenchable envy for that which they do not have. The difference between jealousy and envy is very important which is that jealousy is you look at what some other guy has and you, you say to yourself, I aspire to want to get that thing. I don't care if it's the beautiful woman or the great bass guitar or a beautiful car or whatever it is, or, you know, a beautiful family. You pick your thing that's going that you're jealous of. That's a positive thing. It's an aspirational thing. Envy is that guy has something that I want. And since I can't have it, I'm going to take it away from him. And that's at the core of Marxist thinking. And I, I need when I when I'm reductionist about this stuff in terms of terminology, I'm doing it on purpose to get rid of all of the rhetorical fluff and nonsense to get it down to the basic unquenchable envy of Marxism and at its core, because that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with personal defect and we have to realize that that's what we're dealing with. And then once we understand that, we know how to counter that. And we can get rid of all the other nonsense about whether it's democratic socialism or it's this or that, whatever. They're all these isms don't matter. At the end of the day, it's envy. Let's get rid of the envy. Let's stop weaponizing it and let's stop institutionalizing it. And then we can move forward as a human, as a, as a much more healthy humanity and body. Politics. I think, I think the globe, I think the globe is waking up to, and we're seeing a shift mm -hmm. to the, to, to the right here, to the thinking, like you've seen in the U S now, Germany, same thing is going to happen. Uh, yes. With the AFD party probably taking a bigger role, it'll be interesting what the election results will look like and what role yeah, they will I, play I'm, in the future. I'm um, really, I'm really encouraged by seeing the 18 to 29 demographic in Germany voting AFD in, in in the recent state elections. I thought that was the biggest tell, and we're seeing the same thing here in the United States. The young, the young, uh, uh, the, the 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 youngsters here in the United States are are starting to do the same thing. Um, I have friends who are like you know, substitute teaching and, you know, local schools and the kids are just m different than what we've seen for the last 25 or 30 years. And it's, a, it's a good, and it's very, very encouraging. Yeah. I think COVID pushed things to, to, to the, t to, to the limit here and uh, mm -hmm. too many people with too much time on their hands blogging about topics that were just irrelevant. Quite honestly, that's sort of that's my a, opinion that's a on good, that. That's a very good point. It's a very good point. Right. Um, a couple more topics I want to talk with you about. Sure. One is the Trump trade, of course. Um, mm -hmm. you, you touched on it. The you, you looked at the markets. And I think, for one, we have to explain what the Trump trade really is. We've talked about it briefly in the summer um, when everybody realized after the, the presidential debate that uh, Joe Biden wasn't a real candidate. Mm -hmm. um, the Trump trade sort of kicked in. We're seeing a return of the Trump trade now in the fall after the U.S. elections. A, what is the Trump trade, Tom? And uh, B, like, explain it to us. How can we maybe benefit from it even? So I think the best way to look at the Trump, the, the Trump trade per se, is it's going to be a, a re-onshoring of the flow of dollars. 
it's we're going to see a this is what the Fed is setting up. It's very, I think it's very clear that's what the Fed's setting up. And I think the Fed is also in a in a bind on a variety of issues in order to get this set up and to unwind themselves from a lot of the things that they've gotten that they got themselves into that they shouldn't have been involved in. Now, I'm, I'm speaking specifically under Bernanke and Yellen. Um, and you have now a, a very, very um you have a you have an institution that is woefully behind the times behind the curve in terms of technology and this and that. there's many issues within the fed i just did a, a podcast with caitlin long i haven't published yet where we go over a lot of this stuff and you know a lot of caitlin's criticisms are, are germane here um but the trade itself is about the fed is setting up a domestic dollar and an international dollar and that those two things are not they're going to be the same dollar but there's going to be a there's going to be a kind of chinese wall between them and it's going to be a soft capital control. You know, like we have onshore you want and offshore you want, right? Which is a hard break. We'll never close our capital account in the United States, right? I, I don't think we will, but I never say never, I guess. Well, it's 99% sure that that's not what's going to happen. But what will happen is you will see a soft capital controls around the important financial assets, which undergird and collateralize the entire system. And now I'm talking about specifically gold, right? And, I, and we're already seeing that. We're going to see um, the the gold produced um, here in the United States isn't going to flow as easily around the world as it has for the last 50 years. It's it's going to become much more of a strategic asset in, in, a, in a financial sense. Um, so I think we're going to see, I think the Fed is not going to fight a higher gold price. They're just not going to fight a higher, they're not going to fight the higher gold price in the same way they used to, which was to keep it down. They're going to allow it to rise slowly in order to recapitalize the uh, the U.S. balance sheet it, and its, its balance sheet as well. Um, well, Powell still continues to cut the balance sheet. Remember, he's cutting interest rates and shrinking the balance sheet at the same time, which the the post Keynesian idiots are all saying. Well, you can't do that. You can't step on the gas and the brake at the same time. Like uh, I have a problem with your idea of the gas and the brake. The economy doesn't work like that. One is a retarding the credit markets, and the other is, you know, handling the, um, the 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 bond markets. It's fundamentally different things. Supply of dollars is fundamentally these are two separate things. Don't conflate them. So, um, really, what I'm getting at here is you're going to have a move into tangible assets. You're going to have a move into the dollar, and you're going to have a move into the United States. That's what the Trump trade is going to look like, and. We're going to see a lot of places that have been propped up by cheap dollars are going to crash and have to find no, new ways to uh, finance themselves. They've been slowly but surely extricating themselves in their short dollar positions through the dollar-denominated corporate and and, and 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 sovereign debt. Good. BRICS then winds up being a natural antipode to that and a natural place to catch those people and those businesses and that trade flow, and that's fine. Powell has said multiple times that there's room in the world for more than one reserve currency. That comes from the Fed chair and Humphrey Hawkins' testimony. I will refer you back to that. And if you look at everything that the Fed has done over the last three years, it is to make good on that statement in its way. Now, there's, again, the, there are a lot of things to criticize the Fed about, and I'm not in any way here to you know absolve the Fed of its complicity at times in you know, really, really ugly uh, activity. But um, in general, right now, it's a fight for control over who gets to issue the new monetary units and which central bank is going to reign supreme. It's always going to be, it always came down to this. And the end, the Fed crowd needs to realize that this is a war and you don't fire and you don't assign Patton to the motor pool in Biloxi, Mississippi, you send him into Europe, and you, and 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 you take territory with it. You fight a war. You know when you're in a war, you fight the war with the generals you have and the army you have, not the army you want and the and and the generals you want. Like, this is the way it is. And I, I'm I'm not pacifist at all. I'm a libertarian, but I'm not pacifist because I'm not an idiot. Okay, I'm going to, you know, when it when it comes down to being, you know, when it comes down to the the way this plays out. That's the Trump trade. The Trump trade is we're going to fight for our sovereignty. 
Now, it's all, everything else is downstream from that. So are you going to fight for your sovereignty? I hope so. I want to see everybody fight for their sovereignty. I want to see these globalists remove. Then we can decide which of these globalist institutions that are sclerotic and terrible and evil and everything else, which ones we need to keep, which ones we need to get rid of. And that's not even going to be up to us. Well, it may be up to you. You're younger than I am. Um, but it, I mean, unless, you know, unless they come up with a longevity potion, it's like tomorrow, I I got 15, 20 years left, folks. I don't see myself living past 75. I, it would be a miracle if I do. So here you go. I, I don't know that I'm going to see it. But if I do, I do. Great. And if, and if I don't, I don't. What Trump can do now is exactly what he did in the, in what Powell did in the time that he was given during the Trump administration, which was to shift and change, to fundamentally alter the way dollars are priced around the world by shifting us off of LIBOR and onto SOFR. This was monumental. It's the uh, downstream effects of it are just being recognized by everybody. And, you know, the other thing that Trump got right during his first term, and there were a lot of things he got wrong, was to replace a lot of federal judges with good people. You know, Robert Barnes would complain that they're, they're too close to the Federalist Society. I don't care. I don't need the purity spiral on this. A lot of them did the right thing in the lower courts to allow a lot of these cases to make it all the way to the Supreme Court to get them overturned. I'm talking specifically about Chevron and Jarkissi and Roe versus Wade and a couple of others. These are important Supreme Court cases. And now we're, you know, and, and, it's, and the dividend is going to be paid as we dismantle the administrative state. And it's going to take a long time. It took decades to build. It's going to take, it may take decades to, to undo. I, I, I love Vivek's um, enthusiasm. I love Elon's enthusiasm that we can do this and, you know, quickly. I, I, I believe that, but, you know, I, I, I want to believe in it, but I'm going to, I'm going to remain in the, in the skepticism mode because I know how, I know how entrenched like ticks most of these people are. And I know how, well, how big the inertia of trying to move and turn around the biggest organization ever created by humanity, the U.S. federal government. It's a big problem. So, you know, and it's not going to be, and it's going to be two steps forward and one step back or three steps forward and two steps back. You know, it's going to be a lot of this. And we've seen it in the sofa markets. We've seen it in the repo market. We've seen it in a lot of these areas. And what, and will it be good for gold? In, in, the, in the long run, what you guys want to know, is it going to be good for gold? Yes. Why? Because gold has to rebalance the Fed's balance sheet. It has to in, it has to improve the Fed's balance sheet by destroying, by, by lowering the leverage multiple of the gold reserves and the real hard, hard collateral of the Fed's balance sheet versus the totality of the Fed's balance sheet. And there may even be another round where, where, where there's a, a small bit of QE or behind trap door, you know, backdoor QE or whatever that has to happen in order to keep the banks from imploding. And we have to realize that these, they're going to be knock on effects of these things. There's going to be bank failures. There's going to be, there's going to be problems, but again, we get our fiscal house in order. It will allow Powell to cut. I think we'll be at, you know, again, if that happens, my base case is that we'll be seeing 3% or 3.25 to 3, 3% on the fed funds rate by the end of 2025. Well, the market is now thinking 3.9%, 4%. Again, I can see that I can see that scenario very, very easily if they come in and cut all the post-COVID spending. Like, let's go back to the 2019 budget where we spent four and a half trillion dollars as opposed to six and a half. That's all we got to do. Let's go back to 2019. Let's just roll the way back machine to 2019 and get rid of all the rest of it. And let's disempower these people and, and move on with our lives. And unbelievable dividends that will pay for the entire world. So Interesting. I've got a couple follow-up questions. Maybe help me understand sure. and summarize a little bit as well. Sure. Like you're saying a lot of U.S. dollars flow back into the United States or money flowing mm -hmm. into the United States as part mm -hmm. of that process. And um, my mind immediately went to real estate. Uh, real estate mm -hmm. is already a tight market. Um, do, do you see that exploding as a, as a consequence of that, like price-wise? Well, like, well, real estate is location, location, location. It all depends on what real estate you're talking about. So let's just, you know, I mean, again, it's going to, the money is going to flow into certain places. Right now we have a, we have a real problem with commercial real estate. You know, we have a lot, we have a huge problem with commercial real estate. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to lay it out in these terms for you to understand what's going on. 
The banks were behind Powell raising interest rates to 5.5%. That's who Powell works for. He doesn't work for you and me. He works for the money center banks in New York. And they said, okay, go to 5.5%. Jamie Dimon was out there literally at Davos saying, get ready for 7% interest rates, folks. Like he was literally telling you, drill, baby, drill, 7% interest rates. He was telling you the story. He was telling, he was giving Powell his public blessing of the policy. The banks took a big, big, big punch in the mouth. And Tom, one topic I'm, they oh, held sorry. on to, and they held on to that. They held, he held on to that um, for 18 months until to make sure that you get rid of Biden, Obama, and everybody else. Now they need to be paid back a little bit for their for what they did. That's why Powell cut 50 basis points in September. I've come to realize, and it's why he's going to cut, continue cutting by 25 here and there as he goes along here. Okay. That's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah. His language got softer in the last press conference. He was adamant about two rate cuts this year, uh, two more rate cuts, one he's done now, but he was adamant. Right. I, I was I was rewatching it and uh, going through the transcript mm -hmm. and it, his, his language got softer about a second cut. So I'm curious if he might, might pause in December, but that, that's up for debate at he this might. point. I, I, I think what he's, I think what he's bracketing for is can Trump seal the deal? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, that's his job as Fed chair. When I read it this way, you know, given my framework, if you accept my framework and you don't have to, but if you use my framework as a, as a, as a, as a framework for the discussion and in my framework, that's Powell saying to Trump, get through the transition. And if, you know, and I reserve the right to raise interest rates or not cut in, um, in December, because I, I reserve that right, uh, as in, as an independent fed chair. So Make the right cabinet picks, make the uh, make the right decisions, and as a warning also to quote unquote the deep state. Oh, by the way, if you think that you're going to win this fight by assassinating Trump, I have news for you: interest rates go to six percent tomorrow, hmm. and I have all the reasons in the world to justify that. And then you all are screwed anyway because you can't you can't maintain the the system that you have, and then you'll have to do the whole thing where you kill the fed bring it back under the treasury and destroy the country and the american people just voted for against that and if you don't and if you think that you're going to play that game that you know the gun points in two directions folks it's just that simple so but again the the goal here is to break the u.s bond market it's to break who guarantees the u.s debt and so it's in davos's best interest it's in the bank of england's best interest it's in not in Russia's best interest and not in China's best interest, by the way. This is why I don't, they're not part of this discussion. But Europe needs the United States destroyed for, in order for them to survive. And so they're doing everything they can to foment a civil war and a breakup of the United States in order to then have the market question who guarantees all this debt. And that's the goal. And so why, and what, and, and that's why German. Bonds are still trading at two negative 200 basis points bias to American debt of the same maturity that and Christine Lagarde creating, you know, the false market. And she's eventually going to run out of other people's money and she's rapidly running out of other people's money. Like that's the, excuse me, that's the game. And that's where we're going to, that's the, and that's the, that's the end game. And so do we get to the inauguration where these people start getting perp walked and all the rest of it? They're all facing the end of their, their reign. We're talking about breaking a 500 plus year banking cartel in Europe that believes they have the right to run the world. No, you don't. You just don't. And we all get it and we can all see you now. Okay. Sorry. These are my laser eyes we're taking you out and if you no. don't and if you don't play ball we'll just kill you all that's what's on the table here that's what the american and i'm not advocating for this i want it to be peaceful you can be bankrupted or you can be given the gold watch and you can leave human politics behind or we can strip you of everything and parade you naked and tarred and feather in the streets and we can bring you to trial for your crimes against children. No. That's what we're dealing with. That's the subtext to all of this. And if you and if people don't get that, 
then they don't understand what why capital markets are acting the way they are. I mean, it really does tie back in the way the capital markets are trading because you see their fingerprints all over the way the markets trade in order to try and shape reality, in order to try and defend themselves. And that's why this is a war and it's a monetary war, but it's also a war for the soul of humanity. Okay? No, interesting topics you touch on. And I almost feel cheesy following up on uh, the hashtag end the Fed kind of discussion. Like it seems like the weirdest right. topic to pick, but uh, mm -hmm. Elon Musk chimed in recently and uh, endorses, you know, plan to let presidents meddle with Federal Reserve after the, the Trump sure. election win. Uh, it was a CNBC headline. Uh, the Financial Times wrote uh, Fed on alert for White House interference. Like, yeah. what what does that mean? What could that mean? And uh, that's, a, that's a Bank of England yeah. play. Dude, this is it's it's literally a British psyop. They sent their little minion in from Politico, a junior staffer from Politico, to ask to ask the Baker question to then set the narrative and then move the Overton window. Like Kamala Harris hadn't finished saying "fight" twenty times in her concession speech, and then twenty four hours later, twenty two hours later, this chick is saying, "Will you step down if the president asked you?" No. Don't you want to give any color on that? No. Next question. No. Like, no commas, no if, no, no. Like, the president, of, uh, the, and this is the process, the president nominates the Federal Reserve Chair, and the Senate confirms, and then it's over, and he's independent. No different than the Supreme Court justices. And Supreme, I mean, everybody's like, uh, like, I can't believe that the Federal Reserve Chair can be, everybody's like clutching their freaking pearls. Like, oh my God, the Federal Reserve Chair can't be recalled by the, by the president, by the most powerful man in the world. Well, neither can Supreme Court justices. I mean, I'm not saying that the, that the Fed's the fourth branch of government or anything, but it has been set up that way. And whether you're happy about that or not is a, is, is a perfectly reasonable question to be asking. And I'm glad it's now on the table. But I got news for you. That the timing on this is clearly designed to neutralize the best asset and the best general we have in this current war, which is Jerome Powell at running a Federal Reserve that underneath him has been moved tremendously in the Marxist into the Marxist camp. And I've warned about this. I warned about this during the 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 insider trading scandal at the Fed created by Lael Brainerd, who signed off on the trades that then she then leaked to Politico that, you know, these guys were doing. And they got the three biggest hawks on the freaking Federal Reserve, on the FOMC, Kaplan, Kareed, and Rosengren. Replaced them with MMTers and communists. Lisa Cook, Sarah Bloom Raskin, and some other, some other, I don't even remember their name. Doesn't matter. That <laughs> They're all, they're all terrible. Uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth and I are the only ones talking about this. Uh, how important this is. And she's, she's been asking the question, what ha Powell's great, but what happens after Powell? Yeah. So this is where, you know, what do we do next? Are there going to be FOMC? Are there going to be FOMC um, members that don't step down? Right. Kate Long and I were talking about this literal little thing yesterday. Are they going to, normally they don't serve out their 14 year appointed terms. Normally they leave after a certain number of times, you know, after a while or, you know, under normal circumstances and they move on to other things. If they all stay, it's because they're ideologues trying to make sure that they under that they get control of the Fed. It's important. You can't you can't run a globalist, you know, two step on the world with the most powerful country in the world and the, with the most powerful central bank in the world, running the most pro powerful currency in the world, if you don't have monetary and or political control over that country. And they've just lost both of them. And this is now this is the first. We're twenty four. We're a week into this. The Biden administration is still in charge. And we haven't even been able to exert both monetary and political control over our own country yet. They still they now want to take the monetary they want to take monetary policy away from us and hand it right back to the very friggin' people who you know have destroyed the country. Sorry. Like the Fed's a problem. It can be, but and it'll have to be reformed in stages and then possibly gotten rid of. Fine. I'm, I mean, I'm okay with that. I don't know what that outcome looks like, but it and it needs to be reformed. And there are a lot of things that it's done that have opened itself up for lawsuits that will fall, that will create some of the reforms necessary to move forward. But as of right now, I'm telling you emphatically, Jerome Powell is the best asset we have for the next two years. 
and yeah, it's, it's, it's next a good year point. and a half. And we need to, and we need to make our peace with that and just yeah. and let and and then and, and figure it out from there. Hold his feet to the fire, but let's have government not fighting amongst itself. Let's have the yeah. Fed and the Treasury Department working in lockstep to save the country, and then by extension, save the world. Because these people are evil, and if they run the table on us here, if they break the United States, and if they, they foment the Civil War, or they're able to destroy the Fed, as of right now, they will win this game. And the sad part for Europe is that they think they're going to, that's the, how they're going to win. The problem is that what's going to happen is that all that money that they thought was going to flow to them is going to flow to China instead. And then the whole West is going to collapse in a way that Martin Armstrong has been talking about for 30 years. That's what he's been arguing. And he's not wrong. Like Europe thinks they're going to win this. And no, that money's all going to flow to China. And then everybody's going to be in trouble. Okay. No, re really good overview. Cause I've, I've no answer and no idea what it would look like if we were to abolish the Fed tomorrow, what, uh, the Mad Max would look is like. a really I've good, no idea. Idea. Yeah, a really yeah. good world. No, no. I mean, it's, no. you're talking about, uh, talking about a 90% collapse in the price of credit-based assets. Is yeah. everybody ready for their house to be worth not 400 grand, but 40 grand? No, no. Are, are you ready for that? No. I, but, yeah, but still, but, but, and, and, but bread will be $20 a loaf. Are you ready for that? No. Boomers? I hope not because <laughs> got news for you. I'm not, but there are ways to deal with this problem. Okay. No. No, Tom. Um, really, uh, rapid fire answers, real quick. I sure. just want to wrap this up real quick. Um, uh, inauguration, I think, is January sixth or seventh. I don't have the ex exact date in my uh, mind right January now. January twentieth. Twentieth. Uh, Electoral college on the sixth. Uh, uh, inauguration on the twentieth. Gotcha. Okay, twentieth. Um, let, let, let's discuss like asset prices. Asset like how is gold going to develop until then? How are the bonds? Like, let's look at the ten year real quick. Uh, about to move. Um, Gold. What's the price direction for gold? I think then? I think we're talking about a correction in gold for the rest of Q4, and then we're going to open up Q. We're going to open up Q1 in 2025, and gold is going to start doing what it always does historically now during um, Q1. Q4 has been bad for gold. Q1 has been traditionally now good for gold, and uh, so I, I expect a rally. I expect them to. I expect gold to digest this rally. There'll be some liquidity concerns, like what we're seeing this morning. You know, gold hitting 2600. I think that's liquidity stuff. Um, you know, but look, the, the euro is literally crapping the bed, like liquidity happens, right? So under those circumstances, gold is always the first thing sold. So ex as long as we don't see any kind of move below 2,500 during this, during this phase, I think there'd be no technical damage done to gold. And then it could set up for a, uh, a very good Q1. I think it'll be very healthy for the gold market. And then we're looking at gold moving into the three, $4,000 range in 2025. Bond yields, real quick, 10 year, two year. What, what are your expectations? Um, two years is going to probably drop if the Fed continues to lower rates. Um, the 10 year is probably, uh, it depends. I, it, it, I, I'm going to say the yield curve is now flat. Let's expect that the short end of the curve is going to fall 25 to 50 basis points, depending on what Powell does. And we may see a, a 25 point sell off or 50 point sell off. If there's a sovereign debt crisis in Europe, we may see a full you know, 50 to 75 basis point sell off in the United States, but we'll see a 200 to 300 point sell off all, all across Europe. Fantastic. Tom, really appreciate your time. Phen phenomenal sure. conversation as always. Where can we follow you and where can we find more of your work? Uh, you got the right down there. So gold, goats and guns is the thing. Just look at, look it up, look my name up. You can follow me on my blog over tomluongo.me or goldgoatsandguns.com. You can follow me on Twitter at TFL1728. And of course you can sign up for the Patreon at Patreon slash gold, goats and guns, where we do the twice weekly market reports where I rant into a microphone and look at charts and <laughs> do the whole technical analysis of the markets, as well as the monthly newsletter where we have a uh, portfolio strategy and uh, forward thinking. That's where all the forward looking content really is uh, for us every month. And of course, I do other private blogs and private podcasts on an ad hoc basis. And then we have a discussion forum and all the rest of it. So phenomenal. No, Tom, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. Really appreciate it. Free way to support us, also, of course, hitting that like and subscribe button helps us out tremendously. Go check out Tom's content. The YouTube channel is fantastic. Good content in there as well. And uh, let me know, should I keep wearing a jacket and a suit here uh, for, for my interviews? Or are you OK with my black T-shirt? So let, let me know. And uh, we'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially. Thank you so much for tuning in.